An exploration of the visual art of Betty Saar, Faith Ringgold, and Carrie Mae Weems will highlight their shared patterns of resistance, and specifically the way memory is revised, reinscribed, and reclaimed in their work. These artists locate the origin of black feminisms with the enslaved black women, whom Angela Davis has deemed to be the, quote, custodians of the House of Resistance, end quote. While Ringgold and Saar began producing visual art decades before Weems began working in photography, we should not limit the dialogue among black feminist artists into only the old or new generational camps. The thematic connections among these three artists suggest the device of visual intervention with the past was deemed successful by later artists. Their strategies, however, do not appear in the work of male Harlem Renaissance artists like Jacob Lawrence and Romare Bearden, who did not foreground the individualized black female worker as a mover and shaker of revolution and empowerment. While American feminist artists like Miriam Shapiro and Barbara Kruger provided the visual tools to create agency, black women in their narrative of resistance were absent from white feminist discourse. The images of Saar, Ringgold, and Weems convey sadness, pointed wit, and a vigilance to recover and rewrite the past, present, and future. This is further illuminated by the work of black feminist historians who have stressed the ever-present aspect of resistance in the African-American woman's history. This first set of images demonstrates the significance of the black female worker as the foundation of resistance and empowerment and provides a means for strategically dismantling stereotypes. In supreme quality, Betty Saar has centralized a black female domestic worker and armed her with two large firearms. The inscription reads, Extreme times call for extreme heroines. Saar's incendiary image is autobiographical in the sense that both her grandmother and mother were seamstresses, but it also calls attention to a history of black women as domestic workers. Saar's figure in supreme quality is embedded in the center of the sculptural grouping. Her assemblage can be contrasted with Jacob Lawrence's images of black women performing domestic labor. In his 1945 work, Home Chores, Lawrence's female figure looks down and away from the viewer, with her body turned entirely towards the basin. In Home Chores, the wash tub is the site of oppression, but in Supreme Quality, the heroine is physically and symbolically supported by the washboard and uses this object, which represents historical resistance and labor, as a platform to stake her claim as revolutionary leader. According to Betty Saar, her most well-known work, The Liberation of Aunt Jemima from 1972, was motivated by the desire to, quote, transform a negative, demeaning figure into a positive, empowered woman, a warrior ready to combat servitude and racism. In this assemblage, Jemima is armed with a broom, a pistol, and a shotgun. Saar explicitly connects the historic strategic resistance of black female labor with the present revolutionary leader. An important concept for understanding the empowerment of the black female worker was introduced in the scholarship of activist Angela Davis, who helped debunk the black matriarch mammy stereotype and foreground the importance of women's domestic work within enslaved communities. Davis's 1971 essay, Reflections on the Black Women's Role in a Community of Slaves, introduced the concept of the black woman as the custodian of a house of resistance. Her work drew attention to the significance of black women's role in their own dwellings away from the master's space during slavery, stating that they were, quote, performing the only labor of the slave community which could not be directly and immediately claimed by the oppressor, end quote. In other words, this housework type of labor became the only work that provided agency and resources to the enslaved community. The inscription of historical oppression onto the site of domestic labor is introduced in Saar's I'll Bend But I Will Not Break of 1998. The vintage ironing board is topped with a drawing of the 1789 plan of the slave ship The Brooks, an image that she printed on rice paper in another work from the series. The implied compression of slaves on the ship reinforced by the ritual of ironing also alludes to the practice of branding that many slave owners use to punish runaways. Saar also references the iron shackles that bound captive slaves during Middle Passage. In this assemblage, Saar invites the viewer to interact with the functional domestic object and the participant is provoked to recall through the act of labor. Throughout the rest of her 1998 Workers and Warriors series, Betty Saar connects the successes of contemporary black women 
to the efforts of previous generations. SARS, lest we forget the strength of tears of those who toiled from 1998, presents a tall, genealogical, and matrilineal tree that has been built from the ground up. This work shows individual washboards stacked three high and depicts a slave on the bottom panel and laundresses in the second and third panels. On top of the washboards, a silver frame shows two black women, one of whom holds a diploma. Sar has explained, quote, my concerns are the struggle of memory against the attraction of forgetting. The washboard, a simple domestic tool, has become my format. For years I have collected vintage washboards and to me they symbolize hard labor. By recycling them, I am honoring the memory of that labor and the working woman upon whose shoulders we now stand." End quote. Not only has freedom been achieved by standing on these shoulders, but they have also allowed a means to access education and professional success. Similarly, in Lest We Forget Upon Whose Shoulders We Now Stand, Sarge features a nurse standing on the fictive shoulders of laundresses. Sarge's transformation of domestic servant to armed soldier throughout her Workers and Warriors series offers a poignant and almost satirical counterpoint to the representations of masculinity within the Black Panther Party. Although Sarge provided a visualization of Black women's powerful public revolutionary capabilities, Black women were still restricted even in circles of the Black Panther Party and the Black Arts Movement. The Black Panther Party was notoriously misogynist, with few women members, most uh, notably including Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, and Kathleen Cleaver. The Black Arts Movement similarly perpetuated a patriarchal hierarchy. The movement thrived on works of Black men, including celebrated Harlem Renaissance artist Romare Bearden. His black artist collective, The Spiral Group, consisted of 13 men and one woman. Faith Ringgold submitted slides to Bearden with hopes of joining Spiral, but he rejected her painting, stating that, quote, it is hard to imagine them being produced by someone referred to as so petite. In response to such patronizing exclusion, Ringgold's visual art was enriched by her participation in 1970s feminist activism, an alliance that many black women were uneasy to forge. Ringgold embraced quilting as a medium that was both charged with familial and cultural tradition, and yet innovative in terms of the contemporary art scene. All of her story quilts were derivative of family episodes, and many orbited on an axis of black female experiences. Sewing and performance piecework were part of Ringgold's own personal history, and provided agency for her mother and grandmother. Ringgold's quilt of a quilting bee from 1997 demonstrates the spirit of collaboration and community among women. The figures are at ease and quilt together within an inspiring environment which celebrates their talent as well as implicitly referencing Ringgold's quilting ability as the artist. In her quilts, Ringgold often brought together groups of living and dead women, as evidenced in her quilting bee at Arles from 1991, and even created a quilt where multiple versions of herself attended a party. Ringgold not only demonstrated narrative exchanges among her figures, but often incorporated her own words and stories across her quilted canvases instead of publishing separate statements. One of her early narrative quilts dealt with rewriting and re-imaging the myth of Aunt Jemima. For Ringgold, Aunt Jemima held universal significance, and the artist rejected the contemporary responses to mammy images in art. She neither found power in the images of the revolutionary Jemima like those of Betty Saar, nor with the subservient Jemima, who appears only as a floating head exemplified in American icons and myths by Andy Warhol. Ringgold found the binary of revolutionary woman or docile servant especially problematic because she herself identified as a quote big black woman. Ringgold's 1982 quilt, Who is Afraid of Aunt Jemima, featured Jemima Blakely, a figure who defies the stereotype in a new way. Ringgold's quilt forges a new identity for her as a mother, friend, and neighbor. Ringgold's Jemima appears as a contemporary woman. Without the label, we might even mistake it as a portrait of the artist herself. Instead of creating a new image for Aunt Jemima, Carrie Mae Weems inscribed new meaning onto one of the original images of Mammy in her 1995 series, From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried. Weems superimposed text on tinted daguerreotypes taken during slavery and reconstruction. The image for the work, You Became Mammy, Mama, Mother, and Then Yes, Confidant Ha, originates from Prentice Polk's photograph, The Boss, a portrait which was intended to be a seated shot. This female subject, however, told Polk she preferred to be imaged standing with hands at hips. Weems stated she wanted to, quote, 
give them a different kind of status first and foremost, and to heighten their beauty and their pain and sadness too from the ordeal of being photographed." End quote. The circular lens-like format, red tinting, and textual inscriptions are Weems's intervention on the way in which these figures are remembered. As Weems has stated, she is, quote, giving a voice to a subject that historically has had no voice, end quote. Weems's methodology, which energizes black and white photographs by tinting, reframing, and inscriptions, is also applied to her image of a rolling pin from her photo series, 22 Million Very Tired and Very Angry People. The work includes text across the bottom, which refers to the famous excerpt from a speech by Malcolm X in which he called for freedom by any means necessary. Weems's image explicitly connects black women's domestic work with resistance and revolution. The tools of domestic labor and revolution, including the washing board, ironing board, and the rolling pin, were objects often passed from mothers to daughter. With this in mind, it is unsurprising that relationships among female family members are consistently featured in the art of Ringgold, Saar, and Weems. This next set of images emphasizes female family relationships and provides another way in which memory is preserved, exchanged, and reinvented. Ringgold worked with her mother until her death in 1983. Saar has collaborated with her daughters for years, and Carrie Mae Weems has featured her own mothers and sisters, as well as recasting a fictive young self in a series of photographs. Ringgold is well known for her quilts and wall hangings, which were first created in collaboration with her mother, Willie Posey. Posey was a successful fashion designer and dressmaker in Harlem, but she also had a background in freehand, traditional African-American inspired piecework, which she had learned from her grandmother, Betsy Bingham. This piecework compiled fabrics as a mean of rearranging to achieve a unified piece. The physical construction of the work additionally allowed Ringgold an element of control over historical subject matter that she felt initially helpless to change. Ringgold's slave rape series showcased a subject matter and experience that had been silenced and excluded from American canonical history and social consciousness. Historian Hazel Carby has asserted that, quote, the institutionalized rape of black women has never been as powerful a symbol of black oppression as the spectacle of lynching, end quote. Three works in the Slave Rape series were portraits of Ringgold and her daughters inserted into the situations of their ancestors. Barbara is depicted in Fear Will Make You Weak, Michelle in Run to Get Away, and Ringgold herself in Fight to Save Your Life. This series was Ringgold's first collaboration with her mother, Willie Posey. Their partnership adds another layer of generational autobiography to the work. Ringgold stated that this series was a way of releasing the frustration over, quote, things we can do nothing about. It is an obsession we cannot escape, so we isolate it, picture it, and then we are free to let it go, end quote. For Ringgold, Saar, and Weems, the reclamation of visual identity involves personal narratives and recognizable faces and objects. This allows them to inscribe every image with personal control as well as political significance. Following the death of her mother in 1983, Ringgold created Mother's Quilt, which shows a mother and seven daughters. The female figures are described with heavily contoured outlines of yarn and cloth. Their heads and necks evoke nesting doll figurines and generational connections among women. The nesting doll illusion also describes the building up and expanding to fit over the previous doll or generation. By building on past traditions of the quilt, Ringgold is able to explore these issues. This recalls the approach of Betty Saar and her washboard assemblages built from the ground up, literally and symbolically. Carrie Mae Weems' Untitled Kitchen Table series includes many scenes that depict the relationship between a mother and daughter. Weems stars in the series as the female protagonist who, in her own words, quote, takes charge of her image, controls it, plays it, and likes it, looks back and loves it. In her series May Days Long Forgotten, Weems stated she was specifically, quote, looking for a young girl who reminded me of myself, end quote. She photographed the girl with her siblings and cousins for Mayflowers and After Manet. The large scale of the photographs and the direct gazes of the girls is a way of intimately introducing the next generation, as well as her memories of her own childhood into the visual narrative. In three prints from the series, Maydays, Weems reasserts this theme in a powerful triptych presentation that centralizes her assertive female sitters while formally reclaiming the powerful iconography of sacred images. The triptych format used by Saar, Ringgold, and Weems encourages memorializing the past 
contemplation, and spirituality. These triptychs, constructed through assemblage, painted textiles, and photography, are used to confront the audience and assert a powerful presence through monumentality. The art of Betty Saar, Faith Ringgold, and Carrie Mae Weems involves recollection and reinvention of the past in medium and subject matter. They engage with the traditions identified by black feminist historians such as Hazel Carby, Darlene Clark Hine, and Angela Davis. Their art shares the recreation of historical narrative, the foregrounding of female family relationships, textual inscriptions, and the use of self-portraiture as a means of reinvention. Each artist has created a responding visual voice and forged black feminist dialogue that successfully intertwines the personal and the political. Memory provides one of the most personal aspects of individual and group identity, and it is the shared reworking of this theme that has made the works of these artists intimate, powerful, and political.